All right. Thank you. Uh, okay. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for uh, coming to the today's seminar. It's a pleasure to have here among us today Dr. Smithy. He's a, a professor in mathematics at uh, in the Department of Mathematics at uh, Notre Dame University. He got his PhD in mathematics from uh, Princeton in '73. He's currently the, the director of center, the Center for Applied Math at Notre Dame. He received uh, several uh, honors and awards, among which uh, the uh, prestigious Alfred Sloan Research Fellowship. And uh, he also was the recipient of the uh, University of Notre Dame Presidential Award. And uh, he served on many committees. And uh, he's very well known in the area of algebraic geometry uh, as a field in pure mathematics, of course. But he's uh, seen uh, great light. And he had the, the vision of turning more applied and now he's actually doing more applied mathematics and trying to use some very powerful mathematics in a ge uh, algebraic geometry to a real problem. It's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Dr. Kerr. So um, today I'll talk about numerical algebraic geometry. Uh, I mentioned a reference to the area up until 2005. It's a book that I wrote with Charles Wampler, an engineer at General Motors on numerical solution of polynomial systems. Articles I mentioned will be available at my website, so I, I won't say much about the references, but if you, know, if you want to read more, just go to my website and you can find all sorts of things there. Uh, numerical algebraic geometry, it, it really it, it grew out of the question of problems from engineering, mainly mechanical engineering at first, but now we have applications in lots of other areas. And recently we've begun to also look at doing exploratory computations in algebraic geometry proper as a tool for mathematicians. But that's a secondary thing, and I won't talk about that too much here. Uh, the problem's always been to combine the algebraic geometry with high-performance numerics, because we, we actually want to get answers, and we use floating point. Uh, the applications, the first ones were in mechanical engineering, um, robotics and mechanism theory. And then these are some of the other ones we've had a lot of successes. I, I mean, I currently work with engineers on combustion problems. So an overview of the talk, I'll start by talking about homotopic continuations. This is a classical method uh, which you can use to compute isolated solutions of systems, and now recently positive dimensional solutions. Um, then I'll talk about Bettini. That's our software package, which you can download from my website, which does a lot of these calculations. And I'll talk about some of the issues about it. And then I'll talk a little about a new method. And that might be a little technical. So if it's a little technical, you know, close your eyes for about five or six slides, and it'll go away. And then, uh, then I'll also talk about some applications. Uh, so anyway, what, what is a polynomial system? It, you have a set of polynomials. Uh, they basically some number of polynomials and some number of variables. And you want to find the solutions. Now, I'm going to, if there's time towards the end, I'll give a little case study of a mechanical engineering problem, just so you can see what systems look like in practice, because they're sort of interesting. Uh, so I'll start with talking about computing all the isolated solutions of such a system. Uh, you usually reduce down to the same number of equations as unknowns. I won't, that's a, the technical way of doing that. I won't say much more about that here. You can read about that on my website. Our main tool is to take something we know and then to convert to something we don't know. So let me make that precise. Uh, first of all, before I do, though, let me say what continuation does. There are a lot of packages out there which do different things. But the core numerical computation, which everything else is based on, is if you give a system, the packages will give back a set of solutions, which a finite, uh, a finite number of points, which include all the actual isolated solutions. But they also might include some solutions that lie on positive dimensional sets. Also, continuation allows us to vary parameters. That's a big point. So those are the, the basic things that all packages do. Everything else is built on top of that by using higher order, um, you know, moving data sets around, whatever. So let's go back to the very bottom and look at how people do this. So we have two systems over here. And I, I guess my laser pointer does not work against these screens, so I have to live with that. All right. So when t is equal to 1, you have the system G, this is the system you know. When T is equal to 0, you have the system that you want to solve. So for example, you might have uh, something 
I have z to the fourth power minus 1 in one variable. You know how to solve this. You have 1 minus 1, square root of minus 1, and minus the square root of minus 1 is your solutions. And you might have over here, oh, oh, OK, sorry. So you have, um, you have z to the fourth minus 1, and you have solutions to that 1 minus 1, square root of minus 1, and minus the square root of minus 1. And you know how to, so that you understand very well. And then you have some fourth degree polynomial, p of, let's say, p4z is equal to, and maybe z to the fourth minus 7z cubed plus 3z squared plus 27.1. Who knows? Something like that. And you'd like to go from what you know to what you don't know. And so what you do is you take, put a t in front of this, and a 1 minus t in front of this, and this is one other little step you have to do, but it, anyway, you take something like that, and this will be an example of a homotopy. Now, when you start out at 1, you're going to get the things you know, and you'd hopefully, if the world is nice, when you got to 0, you know, you get nice pairs, which you might not. You can always assure that you will, though, by a little trick, which I, I might talk about or not. But anyway, these are what homotopies look like. So you start with known solutions, and you go to solutions you don't know. Now, an important thing is that these pairs satisfy an equation. So if you think about it, here's t, here's 1, here's 0, and you have the things you know at 1, and as you go to 0, you're going to get pairs. For each value of t, the solutions will form together to form a path. And that, that can always be ensured by putting a random complex number in here. So I'll just say that. Um, and we'll say more about why. So anyway, you have something like this. And now these things will satisfy if we take this equation, this homotopy, and we call it h of zt, then the pairs will satisfy that equation in the z cross t space. And z could be, in, in more generally, a whole set of variables. And so what you could do is you could you can imagine trying to use an ODE solver to start out with what you know and just track to the end. And that'll work. Um, but there's something really nice here, that you have that function. And so if you have these paths over here, you can actually do a prediction. So you have a path. You can actually do a prediction, let's say by Euler's method, and then in the, in the vertical direction, you can use that function, you can use Newton's method to come down. Now, I used Euler, but I could have just as used Runge cut or something like that, which would track the curve a little more closely, in which case Newton would have to do a little less. Um, what's the best thing to do that, you know, that's somewhat problem dependent? So a guiding principle when we do all this is that you have to avoid paths leading to singular solutions. Now, let me maybe say a word about this. this is, the first time you see this, you know, at least pure mathematicians, they, have a, they sometimes have a problem in this direction. Uh, I'm not, not the ones who are computationally oriented, but the, the general ones. Um, this, they think of a polynomial system. You have n polynomials. And they think of something where, you know, they might know the degrees, you know, d1 out to dn. But then these polynomials are sort of dense. They have every possible monomial that can occur. But that's not what happens in engineering problems. Uh, in engineering problems, actually, the equations are usually very sparse. And that turns out to translate, usually, into there being very few solutions in the finite part of the plane so, uh, of Cn. So it, one of the, you, it might have some equation where, when you multiply the degrees out, you have a million. But it might be there's only 100 solutions, actually. And this is very common in engineering problems. So uh, the spartanness is very important. Now, if you, if you don't pay attention to that, if you don't somehow or other build that into everything you do, then you could imagine starting out with this system with an incredible number of solutions, but there's only a few over here. Well, what's going to happen? Well, most of these are going to have to go to infinity, because in the, essentially the number of solutions will be this product counted right if you work in the projectivized space. We add infinity in. So the fact that there are a few in the finite part means there's going to be an incredible number in the infinite part. Now, you might say, oh, so you mean you're going to be tracking a lot of extra pairs. That's part of it, but it's worse than that. Because when you have these extra pairs, they typically are going to have very bad singularities, which means many, many pairs will go to the same point. And what that translates into is incredibly terrible numerics um, as you get near those points. Oh. Um, yeah, there's actually, there's an easy way around this. 
you have, but we do end games, and I'll talk about those a little. But end games cost computation, so it's not, it's not that you know we can do that, we can find them, and find them accurately. But you have to go to high precision, and you pay a price. We'll talk about high precision a little later. So, so yeah. So the point is, it's it's all you know. If if you just want an answer and you're willing to wait forever, this will work. But otherwise, you want to be a little clever, all right? And the software is a little clever. That's that's the point. Um, okay. So I'd say a word about hardware. When I first got into this game, I was a pure mathematician back then, and what happened is we had some people from General Motors. One person gave a talk, and it was about a robot arm, and I, I made a stupid little comment about how it, you could have a lower number of paths to follow if you did some little thing. I basically worked in products to protect the space. Anyway, they made me a consultant, and I, I got sucked into this. I mean, it turned out it's really pretty exciting stuff. So, but anyway, when I first started, uh, the machines were very slow. Uh, three minutes a path on the largest mainframes. In 1991, it was a little better, but it still took a long time. We solved a big problem, and it took 300 CPU hours. Um, now, you're going to get 1,000 pairs a second on a moderate, you know, very small cluster. And so this is the flavor of where things are going. So in, in five years, you can expect to see many, many thousand more. But the, the, this, these algorithms parallelize almost perfectly. So if you have a multi-core chip, you take advantage of that. And that's a big advantage of these methods. OK, let me talk about positive dimensional sets a minute. How do you, how do you represent them? This is a basic issue. Um, you have a system. Imagine you had x, y minus 1. Well, that has these two pieces. How do, you know, of course, the two lines, the axes. You know, you could try to represent them by x equals 0 and y equals 0. Working with equations is, turns out to be expensive. As you go to more and more variables, the equations have more and more terms. Curve fending gets more and more expensive. Uh, so we do it a different way. What we do is we, we take a random slice. And let's say make believe you had this in C2 with a random line. And this random line will meet in two points. We take those two points as a proxy. Or so a representation of that positive dimensional set. Well, you might say that, that you know, points don't represent sets. But in fact, you see, in homotopic continuation, you're allowed to move that line and track those points. That's cheap. That's what homotopic continuation does. And so knowing that line, knowing those points, and knowing the original system, then without hardly any computation at all, you can get hordes of points on that. So you can get as many as you want for any computation. Uh, so to give a picture of it, imagine, now this, this is not a perfect picture, but imagine you, had a, you were in three space and you had a cylinder, some points, and a curve defined by a system of equations. Well, the reason why this picture isn't so accurate is that in, over the complex numbers, or working over the complex numbers, though ultimately we want things over the reals, we work over the complexes until the very end. But over the complex numbers, th things don't look quite like cylinders. They sort of stretch out. For instance, if you're working with x squared plus y squared minus 1, and you're thinking about that in, in real xy space, then a line might hit it in two points, but you move the line a little, and it misses it. Not so over the complex numbers. Over the complex numbers, almost every line you pick will hit it in two points. All right? So working over the complex numbers, um, it, it make, this all works very well. Then coming back to the real, you should do it after you have the complexes. So the idea is for that top dimensional cylinder, we'll represent it by having a slice with a, a random line. The random line will meet it in two points over the complex numbers. As we move that line around, we can get more points. That's great. But now look what happens when we do it with a plane. When we slice it with a plane, well, we're going to get the curve right. You see, we have those points on the curve. That's great. But it's going to slice that cylinder. That means when we use our solver, ultimately all solutions come down to isolated points. Everything is always reduced to those. And so when you try to solve it, what you're going to get is you'll get those isolated points on the curve, but you're also going to get some, some points that lie on that cylinder. And then finally, you take the intersecting with the whole three space itself. And that, well, that's a sort of stupid case, but that will give you the isolated points, but it also will give you some points, maybe different ones on the curve and maybe some points on the cylinder. OK, so now Bottini is our software. Um, we, there are a number of packages out there. There's PHC, there's um, Compact, there's, I think, PolySys. There, there are many, many people have different versions of, of things. 
Only PHC besides ourselves does the positive dimensional. Uh, there's, but there's a big difference. Ours is a newer code. Their, that code is somewhat older. It's um, based on ADA, in fact. And it was added on to over the years. Uh, this is an, a newer code. It has the algebraic geometry constructs built in right at the very bottom. Uh, it also has something that's sort of neat. It has adaptive precision built in. So if you think about certain types of calculations, if you could increase the digits, it would turn out that things would be OK. But increasing the digits, well, I'm going to talk about that. You know, that's what adaptive precision is all about. These things are written in what language? C. These packages, C. C. Okay. Uh, but when we're about to rewrite it in C++. Okay. So no, it's modern language. That's yeah. So let me give you some examples of problems why, that, why you might have to do something. So let's look at this silly thing. The basic tool we always use is we track as we slice. So imagine you have a line, and you represent it by slicing with this line over here. And now you might want to change that to be able to do some computation. And you see so you're going to get new points. Well, ultimately, you come down to isolated points, and you'd come down to that tracking I talked about earlier with uh, Newton and all that. But if you had something like that, where this, this, was, this line over here was defined by z1 squared is equal to 0, then it's singular. And so when you start writing down your Jacobians, your Jacobians are basically going to be 0 along there. And that basically will cause things to collapse. So that's a problem. Because you need, when you do tracking, you need non-singular Jacobians. So how do you deal with that? So this is a technique I'm not going to say much about, but it's, a, it's really been revolutionary in the last few years. Uh, it, it's an old idea, but the idea is to differentiate away the singularities. All right? So in one variable, that seems pretty obvious. You know, If you have p of z, a polynomial, and you had a, a cluster of roots, and maybe some roots out here, then you might think, well, I have six roots over there. If I differentiate it once, then I should have probably six, you know, five roots over there. And that's basically true. Uh, there's very precise results in that direction. And so if you differentiate it six times, unless these points were really, really close, you would get the centroid, more or less, of those points. All right. So by replacing with a differentiated thing, you can actually get a non-singular thing. But if you try that in server variables, it doesn't work. But there's a trick. And the trick is to take your system, let's say it defined an isolated point. And this, is the, this is the z space, this board. And now what I do is I take the Jacobian, and this point is isolated, but it's singular. It might be, for instance, defined by z1 squared is equal to 0, z2 squared is equal to 0. And so now I take the Jacobian, and I dot it with new variables, psi1 out to psi n, where there are n equations. And this is going to, at that point, that matrix, is go, that equation is going to define some linear space, because you have linear equations. You evaluate the Jacobian at the point in question. That's going to, you're going to get these linear spaces. And so you have the isolated point, and over it you have this linear space. And now you slice it in the new, in the new psi variables with a complementary dimensional plane. Well, why would you do that? Well, it turns out that the thing becomes less singular. It's just like differentiating in one variable. And by doing this procedure, you gradually make the thing non-singular. And so this is, a, this is called deflation, and it's, it's, very, it's very powerful. So to make a alg viable algorithm for multiple components, you have to make decisions on ranks of singular matrices so you can use this, uh, this procedure. And to make decisions about ranks of matrices, you have to essentially compute roots very carefully so that you're close to the actual points. And so this is what end games are all about. So end games concern. And this, is a, this talk is an overview. And all the, you know, some of the, a lot of these things are classical. The deflation is newer, but some of this is at least 15 years old. But the end games turn out to be very important. Imagine you have a lot of pairs coming to the same point. How do you decide what that going to? As you get near that point, the linear algebra is falling apart in a way I'll make precise in a minute. And so you, it, it's, it turns out that it's, it's very hard to do the tracking anywhere near that. I mean, imagine this was the t variable, and imagine this, you have z, um, z to the 10th, or z minus t is equal to 0. Then, and so this, if we had that, then of course, when t is equal to 0, you're going to have 0 as your solution. 
But think about it. If I had, for instance, that I, I was at 1 one hundredth, so I'm at t is equal to 1 hundredth, then the solutions of this are going to be the tenth root of 1 hundredth. That's a pretty big number, all right? And that's the problem, that as you're, that until you, if you're, even if you're very small over here, their thing will be far away from the root. And so how do you decide to do that correctly? Well, we, we have different end games for that, because you could curve fit, but a very powerful one is to think of this t parameter as a complex plane. And now you could take a point on it, and as you track around a little circle, you can track that point around. And when it comes back around, it might come to a different point. And you keep going until finally you come back to where you start from. And now you can do a Cauchy integral from complex variable. And you can pin that value directly. Well, there are some little worries there. Uh, the tr one trouble is that you do that on a certain circle. But it might be that to make this work, you have to be a circle that's much smaller. But there is going to be a region where you can't do it because the Jacobian is going to basically be so zero that there's no way of doing any computation. And so the trouble is the region where the thing works might be contained inside an ill-conditioned zone where you can't hope to do it. So high precision is the way around this. And um, it wasn't practical. I mean, it was, it's been around for a long time, but it wasn't practical until recently. Um, first of all, so you use it for all these reasons. I just talked about the one with the end game. But let me say a word about the other ones. Let's say you had a simple polynomial like that. Not, not a bad polynomial. You can use your favorite software package, let's say Maple, and you can compute a root to 15 digits. Well, if you plug it in, you don't get anywhere near zero. But that root is exact, that number of digits. And that's a common problem. So when you plug it in, it doesn't, it doesn't, it's not zero, even though that's right to that many digits. And similarly, if you add a few more digits, well, you're a little closer to zero, but not much. The point is that you've gone to a high enough degree polynomial that you have to add more digits for that the property of being approximately a zero to translate into being zero. This is, this is a numerical problem. But it's a really a numerical problem. But then how do you know that it's a, it's a root? Well, the homotopy continuation will find it to that accuracy. Okay. And you're, you're really sure it's, it's close to a root. And well, you can check it. You know, if you I guess my question is, how do you validate it? I mean, how do you? Well, you va it, 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 homotopy continuation validates its root as it comes in. But the point is, we would like to be able to evaluate it. Right. But the point is, evaluation being being zero doesn't necessarily correspond to being close to a zero. See, it, it could well be, as this example shows over here, that to that amount of accuracy, if you would do your exact arithmetic, you're not going to get a zero. It's, it's because the fact is you have to be, to be able to get the p of the thing being zero, you have to be much closer. If you went up to 20 digits, you would begin to see that it... So the thing is that root is accurate to 16 digits, but when you plug in, it's not zero. And that's just the way it is. All right? And it, the, you know, the equation is not so far out of whack as you might think. The trouble is it's 10th degree. 10th degree is actually already high, but they do occur in practice. So multi-precision takes care of a lot of these problems. Another one, this is a big one for us. If you have, there's a theorem in linear algebra called Wilkinson's theorem, which what it says, it says something very interesting. If I have a matrix, and I'm, I'm not going to give the statement, but let me say what it, it says, essentially you want to solve a problem like this. You do this all the time, where this is a, this is a matrix you know, uh, this is this you know, and you're trying to find x. So. You know, if you think, well, if what stands in the way of being able to solve this? Well, if you take a numerical analysis, you know that it's not the determinant of A being zero. For example, if you had one tenth and one tenth, and zeros off the diagonal, so one tenths on the diagonal, and you had this was a thousand by a thousand, the determinant of this would be one over ten to the thousandth, which would be very close to zero. But this is a trivial thing to solve, right? You, know, you just multiply each thing by ten. And so what was realized was that it's not the determinant, but it's the condition number, which is the product of the, the uh, some norm of the determinant times some norm of the inverse, where if the inverse doesn't exist, then we'd say that the condition number is infinite. Now, this is norm dependent, but cha different choices of norm just changes by a constant. Intuitively, what it is, down in projective space, if you projectivize, then there's a set defined by the determinant condition, and this is going to be 1 over the distance to that set. It turns out to be very close to that. 
So the condition number turns out to control everything. And what Wilkinson's theorem says is you can tr compute the condition number, and let's say it was 10 to the eighth power, then you're going to probably, or you could well lose, or for certain choices of, of uh, A with that situation, you lose eight digits of accuracy. All right? so, so basically, the condition number, if you take it log base 10 of it, it tells you how many digits of accuracy you, you, you're losing. And so if, you know, if you're going along and you're getting close to this point, and now the condition number reaches 10 to the 15th power, and you have 16 digits, you know, you're, you're talking about garbage. All right? But if you could now go up to a higher precision, and if your condition number stayed at 10 to the 15, it's not a problem at all. all right? So condition number, of course, this would depend on how exactly you knew your original solution. But in engineering problems, typically, you have, um, you have equations of the form f of xq, where there's a parameters and there's the variables you're interested in. And these equations usually are absolutely gorgeous. I mean, they have small integers. They're really very nice. And an engineer has a little fuzzy information here. It might be a robot. These might be lengths of arms and things like that. And so, you know, if you have this, and these are, let's say, you knew these to 10 digits. If you increase them to 15 digits just by arbitrarily choosing some point on the parameter space, you're not going to change the engineer's problem much. But now you're going to be able to use the higher precision. And that, that works very well. Uh, so how do you use higher precision? One approach with the PHC code, that's the other one that does positive dimensional, is to run paths over that fail. Uh, this is incredibly expensive. And this is, you, you know, see what happens. You have about 15 digits, and it takes, <clears throat> we, we took a problem, and we did it enough times that it would show up when we ran it. <clears throat> so it takes two and a half seconds. You go from 15 to about 17 or 18 digits, just a tiny increase, and now it takes more than 10 times longer. <clears throat> so just a little bit more, and it's a, and much longer. And then it's very slow. You, then it's slow, it doesn't change much. Why is all this? Well, that's because we're using a package GMP. One of the reasons why this is all practical is that part of the GNU, the GCC compiler, comes with a multi-precision package now, which is absolutely standard. And by being standard, it runs on all machines with GCC. That means Windows, Macs, etc. So you can, have, you can be guaranteed there's going to be a, a pretty good version of multi-precision running on any machine and taking advantage of their hardware. Unfortunately, it doesn't quite at this point take care, advantage of the hardware. To take, they took the common denominator of all the hardwares, and so they do it in, the, in terms of a bit. They don't take advantage of the fact that hard, you can do hardware 16 digits on most machines. And so because of that, that first time you will go over, it's doing things in software, and you get a big hit. But after that, you get the, the, essentially the speed up predicted by theory, which is about n log n. All right, so this is changing, though. New versions will get better. But anyway, the present moment is expensive. And so what we do is adaptive precision. We change our precision as we go through it. Now, um, so the, say the issues. You have to stay in your parameter space. That was the point I was making before. Uh, parameter spaces, engineers often are working with random points to some extent. They only know it in a fuzzy way. What that translates into is, they're working with what happens on the parameter space as a whole. And usually, that's pretty good behavior that you can get your hands on. Um, and near singular conditions happen. This was with our new software. We were just curious, uh, do we actually use this multi-precision any place besides endpoints? Well, let's see what could happen. Imagine you're tracking from 1 to 0. And imagine you have a path which is going like this. And imagine you have a path, sorry, which is going like this. You could be coming along, and you could actually split over to the other thing. That's called path crossing. Right, that's, a, that's a real problem. That's corresponding to being near a branch point. So you might ask yourself, um, what do you do? Well, our software monitors things like the condition number, and it increases precision as needed dynamically on the fly. And so we, we asked ourselves for the, a non-trivial problem, which is the one I'm going to talk about at this time afterwards. I, have a, I handed, gave handouts on that, and I have some slides on it. And uh, this was a problem which was the hard part, the one which took 300 CPU hours in 1992. Now, you know, it's not so bad, but it's 143,000 pairs you have to track. And so we asked ourselves, how many of the paths between here and here ran into trouble 
not at the end game, but somewhere in the middle. Turned out it was uh, almost 1% of the paths ran into problems. And so, you know, of course, this is why a lot of software out there gets very funny answers. They get little you know, mistakes. We don't have those mistakes because of the fact that we dynamically change precision, but we can, we can see those are the places where there'd be trouble. There'd be path crossing. Uh, is there any uh, systematic way of avoiding these? Uh... Um, and, well, the thing is, the methods what they call probability one. Imagine, imagine here's, the comp here's the T plane, and here's one, and here's zero. And you want to, you, you, if you take a random path, you right. avoid these finite number of branch points mm -hmm. where bad things happen. Mm -hmm. But of course, in practice, you could come close to one of them. Mm -hmm. And as you get to higher dimensional problems, and we're now beginning to concentrate on problems which have millions of pairs, tens of millions of pairs, the number of branch points begins to look pretty dense, all right? And so you are going to get close to them. The only way not to get close to them is to use enough precision so that they are far away from you. See, it's like if you're using 16 digits, two things which look close are far apart, on the other hand, if you had 32 digits. And so we detect that there's problems, but when you get near these points, the Jacobian and other things begin to have trouble. I'm so do you have a way of detecting that? Yeah, we dynamically change. Yeah. Yes? Uh, would using a diff different CPU architecture, like the recent uh, AMD64 architecture, which has a native 128-bit floating point format help? Or no? the, yes. All right, so uh, there's two issues there. Probably for a lot of problems, if you had your software and it could take care of, uh, you know, take advantage of twice the number of digits, for instance. For instance, you know, the AMD Optron 250s, they actually are designed so that if you have them together. My understanding is you can actually have it that you can double the number of so you know, hardware floating point uh, in, in hardware. The trouble is that we don't want to develop things for individual chips. Mm -hmm. And that's why we want to use a, a general package. Okay. So... It, that same, the, the, because, well, Intel also has the thing in the latest Core 2 chips as well, so is the... Yeah, but see, we oftentimes have to go higher. That would solve some problems, but it wouldn't, wouldn't solve everything. Okay. You know, we, 128 would, would do a lot for a lot of people, but occasionally we go higher than that. Okay. Yeah, so, no, it, but what you'd like, ideally, was something like that, where the, the new compiler took advantage of, you know, you see, where the GMP starts... It can, it basically, it's going to do something, in all these methods, you can do something in hardware, and then there's a hierarchy of methods as you have multiples of that basic unit. At first, there's a thing called Katsusura multiplication, where you can basically imagine if you have A, you know, you can, you can do your multiplication so that instead of using, you break it up into maybe A plus B times 10 to some power. And now if you multiply this times something else, you might think, well, I have to multiply th this piece and that piece, you know, four of them. But actually, by being clever, you can get down to doing three multiplications. All right? So, so the, the, tr the trick is that you, at first, there are little tricks like that. And then at some point, there's the fast Fourier transform, which gets you down to n log n. But that doesn't cut in until maybe, I think it's five or six of the basic units out. You know? So what ideally would happen was you'd have the, the and that's what the GNU compiler does. But currently, it, it starts out with one bit things. And so if it would take advantage of that, and that'll come. I think that's just a matter of time. And I'm looking for the future. I, I you know, but you raise a good point. Okay. It, it you know, you, I remember a previous slide saying that hardware was 52 bits. I guess the remaining bits were the, out of the 64 were the Mantissa. Same amount of bits would be in the 100 of the Mantissa. I mean, the, not the at Mantissa, but the exponent. The exponent would be the same size in the 128 bit. Yeah, format, but it's the number the of digits we, we use. I was giving those examples, but we, we do go up to quite a few. So we, don't, we can't predict how far we're going to have to go before the thing will, will work. Though often 128 would be enough, but we, we do more than that. Uh, okay, so now let me talk about these new methods. These are very excited about, and, I, and this is maybe, some of it will be too technical, but let me explain the idea. Um, a lot of systems that come up in engineering, and like this 9.1, which the ALS problem, which I, I hope to, I can talk about a little, and I think there might be some time, have the property that there are very few solutions, though the systems, if you multiply out the degrees, are very large. So you have to track an awful lot of paths. All right? So now, let's say I have a problem which I care about solving, and it doesn't have 
20 equations like some of these do, but has 50 equations. There are many problems like that. And that would mean that, that it might be you're tracking 2 to the 50th power, let's say something like that number of paths, even though at the end there might be only 1,000 solutions. Well, you're never going to finish. That's too many paths. So what, is there some way of actually being able to solve systems which are very large but have few solutions? And so this is the, what we call the equation by equation method. Uh, the idea, and there's some papers on the, the first approach, the new approach is with my student, John Howenstein, and it's very new. Uh, basic idea, it's sort of a simple idea. It's almost stupid. It says, well, look, I have a system. Solve the first equation. What, what does that mean? You're going to find all the positive dimensional divisors. Now take the first two equations. Find the places where they vanish. Find the first three equations. Now, why would that lead to any advantage? Well, it might be that if you're looking for isolated solutions or non-singular solutions, which you often are, then to be a non-singular solution, once you have something with the two equations meeting something co-dimension one, there's no way it'll ever get down to being isolated. So you can throw those pieces away. And, or if, if you got something which was co-dimension two after two equations, but it was singular, high multiplicity, there's no way that could lead to a non-singular solution. And so you can throw away pieces. It's like this thing where you start out and you start looking at the first equation, and the amount of work you're doing at each stage keeps getting worse and worse, but you're able to throw away pieces, and hopefully you'll be able to throw away an awful lot and make the thing doable. Uh, well, I, I, these slides you can skip. But I'll maybe run through them so they get them there on the, on the film. So uh, the first approach was, so the, in, intuitively, what you remember the way we look at this, we have, um, we have our system, F1 to Fn. And here's F1 to Fk. And here's these random linears. All right? And that's what our proxy was for the co-dimension k part. And now I want to go from that to the, I want to add in the, the k plus first equation. So, and here's, here's my linears. I have, so I have a random set of linears, L1 to Ln. I take the, these ones with the first k, and then I take these with that one. And so that's what I have. These are the witness sets. So these are the sets of points which I get by intersecting the zero set of this with the, the linear space defined by that. And what I'd like is a procedure which converts me over to the same type of set now for the k plus 1. And if I keep going this at the very end, that Wn will, be the, will contain the isolated points. All right, so that's the idea. And the approach, the first approach, was to do this. We doubled the number of variables. All right, that seems pretty strange, right? But you double the number of variables. Well, first of all, you do two things. You, you notice over here, these k plus 2 linear equations are common to everything. So you might as well restrict to the zero set of those linear equations. So do that. So you're restricting yourself to a ck plus 1. And now we double the number of variables to ck plus 1 by ck plus 1. And you, if you do that, if u and v variables, I take the first k equations and the u variables, the k plus first and the v variables. I have the linear equations for the u variables, and I have the ones for the v variable. And now I have my witness sets. Those are a solution of this system. And I force it by a homotopy to go to this where I have the diagonal there, which forces the u's to be v's. Well, it turns out that that will actually do that procedure. And that's called the diagonal method. And that's a good method. Um, an another one, you can make it even better, though, by uh, since you have these are linear equations, you can, re you can restrict that you can have this system, and you can have a parameterization of this set of linear equations. And you can have a parameterization of the zero set of this set of linear equations. And you call those parameterizations um, phi and psi, or psi and phi, or whatever you want to call them. I guess psi and phi. And now you can do a homotopy between them. And I, don't worry about technicalities that are there, but it's all set on the slide. And that's the intrinsic diagonal method. It's a good method. The new one method we have is sort of really silly, but it's, uh, it's actually very powerful. Uh, what it does is it, it takes the same initial data as before, but instead it says, well, look, if I know this, I can do simple homotopies where I have these d random linear equations where d is the degree of the k plus first equation. So now if I've done that, then I could take the product of those linear things. They'll be the same degree as that, and so I could do the homotopy where the first k functions don't change, but these ones, I homotopy between the solutions. 
And so these are two different methods to generate that new witness set. One of them does uses the diagonals and you know the, the in u1 minus v1, u2 minus v2, and bakes a homotopy which forces you go to go to that. And the other one, on the other hand, uses what you know to build up the new equation and then does that. So, and this is an example of a system. I'm not going to say much about it. Uh, I, if I had time, I, well, this is a typical system that arises in engineering. Uh, this one here has 24 equations. You have a gamma 1 out to gamma 8, gamma 1 hat out to gamma 8 hat, and there are the variables. And this comes up in a mechanical engineering thing with four bars. And if you just did this in a blind way, it would be very hard. Uh, but there was a cleverer way of doing it, which Freudenstein and Roth discovered years ago. What basically what you do is you think of this as linear equations in the gamma and gamma hats. So you can use the Kramer's rule to solve a gamma and gamma hat in terms of everything, and then plug it into here. So you, you solve a gamma and gamma hat, with, think of these as the coefficients, and now you plug it into there. And so this will give us eight equations in the new variables, and it turns out that it has degree 7 to the 8th, or I guess 5.7 million solutions. They couldn't solve it. Now we found a more clever way, but anyway, let's hear some timings. So there are different variants of this system, and that, that's what the slides we're going to talk about, which I gave the handout on. But if you do it by standard path tracking with one of the variants of the system, it takes 35 hours. Uh, with regeneration, it takes about 1.4 hours. And with uh, the diagonal approach, it takes about 6.3 hours. Now, uh, here's another version. This was the most efficient version we ever found for the problem, the one we actually did with 300 CPU hours. It takes 100, 1 hour and 20, and 20, you know, 1.25 hours with standard path tracking. That means we just track the paths. But if you use regeneration, it only takes 0.3. And see, this is sort of interesting because here, this was the system. This system is very easy to find, and regeneration is quite competitive with the standard method on the absolutely best system, which was found after a lot of thinking. Now, the first one is the system an engineer would write down, and people's time is worth something. And so if you could just take the system you write down and, and not be super, super clever to get this system, which we were super, super clever to get, well, you see, that's, so I think regeneration is a big advantage. It means that people can dump in systems which are much more complicated than they ever used before, and the software will solve it. Now, the beta versions of Bettini that are on my website don't have regeneration, but we're about to come out with the 1.0 version of Bettini, after which we'll have numbers, and that will have regeneration built in. Uh, I, here's the, the, the Roth system, the Einstein Roth. It takes two and a half hours on a, with regeneration, and it takes 38 hours standard pair tracking, if you actually wanted to do it. We just took a thousand random pairs and estimated time from that. So we're, we're very happy with these methods, and we think they're going to be very important. So they, equation by equation, used on a badly formulated, is comparable to the standard on the best formulated. And regeneration, diagonal has an advantage that it lets you do some other things, but for finding isolated solutions of equation, regeneration seems to beat it very well. And the last little bit, and then I'll try to do all this problem if I have a minute or two, to give an, an over-constrained mechanism problem, which we we're concerned about. Now, this is uh, what they call a Stewart platform robot, and they're standard if you go into an industrial setting. These are I mean, I think I have a picture of one over here from an industrial setting. And what they do is they might do solder guns. There's all sorts of things they do. And the way they work is they have ball joints at the top and bottom, and so that they, they turn easily. And they have telescoping legs. And so as you change the length of the legs, it changes that upper platform. Think of the base platform is fixed. And so you can move that around to go in different directions and, and do various chores. Um, if you keep the legs length fixed, the thing is rigid. But it turns out that's not always true. Um, there are some special configurations, like if you take two equilateral triangles where they're opposite each other, then in fact that, that thing will move even though the legs are rigid. And finding those what they call over-constrained mechanisms can be very useful because a mechanism which has a movement you don't expect, you can use to do something. Right? And engineers like those. And so how do you find over-constrained mechanisms? 
I had a little movie of one. They're algebra these are algebraic curves, by the way. And I don't know if this will, will work, but we'll... Ah. Okay, I didn't used to have to, but okay. Um, you know, I, I won't search for it. <laughs> So I probably wouldn't find it. All right, so anyway, all right. So to automate it, though, it turns out that there's a problem here going from a, you can think of this as a map from, you have a, you have certain, a certain set of all possible, these robots, these mechanisms, and now you map down to these fixed leg lengths, and the ones where you have a positive dimensional fiber, that's going to correspond to things that move. And so mathematically, that comes down to the question of if you have a map between algebraic varieties, how do you find the sets where the, the fibers are the wrong dimension, bigger than they should be? But it seems to, to me, if you keep, if you keep the, uh, the leg uh, length uh, uh, constant, uh, there's actually a very finite positions that that platform is going to take on. Well, yeah. So typically, if you, take, if you keep the legs... Uh, you know, constant, there are 40 solutions, okay? And they, these 40 solutions, it could be that, that they're, most of them are complex. There is, in fact, one configuration where all 40 are real, right? So that, and that's, a lot, of, a lot of people have beaten that one to death. And you're absolutely right. Um, but for certain configurations, very symmetrical configurations of the leg, even when the thing is fixed, instead of getting 40 isolated points, you get a 40 degree curve, all right? And, that, and those are interesting because then you can keep the legs constant and you have a little motor, and you can move it around on that path. So if you could make, and so this is why open constraint mechanisms are interesting, you can, make, you can make in principle a mechanism which would trace out some motion. Like, for instance, how do you make a windshield wiper? They, they basically take a, well, it's a four bar, which one, and then you make it pass through certain points. So let me, I'll, I'll, if I have time, I'll do that without, all right? But the, so these over-constrained ones are interesting because you can, you can make them into useful machines. And how do you find them? So for, the, for this one, I mean, there's a long list of them, and I think they might even have close to the complete set. But you can change this type of mechanism very slightly, and it's open problems. There's an industry of doing it with four bars and five bars and six bars and space and things like that. Four bars were done a long time ago. Five bars are still open. And we like to automate it so that we can just sort of push a button and just grind it out instead of having to be clever. And so mathematically, it comes down to a problem of finding, we have a map between spaces. This is usually the physical parameters, and this is the actual objects. You have the mechanisms you map down to leg lengths and things like twist angles, things like that. And you want to find out where this fiber is the wrong dimension. And we had a, Charles Wampour, the engineer at General Motors, have this approach where what you do is you do something called fiber products, which basically it constructs a new system out of the old systems. And what will happen when you do that is that the, these exceptional sets, the ones that we're trying to find, which correspond to the exotic mechanisms, will correspond to irreducible components. But we know how to find those. The trouble is that the systems get very large, even though we know there are only few solutions. And so that's why the equation by equation approach comes in. Now, we haven't implemented this yet. We, that's something we're doing. So let me end with some pros and cons of the different methods. Uh, algebraic symbolic methods, which we think are very interesting, and we try to build them into our systems as we can. They've been around a long time. Many people work on them. Um, they can give exact answers. They're, you can work in characters. P, which if you do coding, is interesting. But they parallelize very poorly. They're unstable when you change the inputs just a little. For instance, uh, you look at x, y minus 10 to the minus 20. And that looks like, doesn't look, it looks almost, if you're looking at it really blind, it would, you know, I mean, it looks almost like the two axes. It's so close to it, but it's really one piece. Now, on the other hand, if you, ha you know, it just looks like it had zero there. Basically, it's going to look different whether you're using 15 digits or 30 digits of accuracy. And, uh, and so that's, I look at that as a virtue of our approach, oh, that, that our answer depends on, you know, you get a different answer for a different number of digits. And that, you know, that, so that's, that's a real advantage. Like, for instance, Charles has said once, uh, you know, you have a mechanism, 
and it's close to a mechanism, but doesn't quite move. It's very, really, really, really close. Well, it squirts some oil on it and moves. All right, I'm, anyway, I'm being flippant. So, but, but the big thing over here is that this paralyzes almost perfectly. With, um, we were using 16 nodes, and we got a 15.9 speed up with that, which is very, very good, and a little higher than that. Now, we, we think, it, you know, of course, there is communication between the processes, but, and that's going to affect us with larger, and we're going to a larger cluster. We expect to see some real slowdown around 200. Um, so this is, uh, this is where I'll end, and I guess I've used up my time, but there are those slides on alts. And yeah. uh, for people at the uh, NCAT, I guess I can send you PDF files of these slides. Should I just I run the slides very fast across the screen so you have them on the movie? Uh, well, we can just send them okay. uh, so that they have uh, slides available. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I would recommend that the slides be available offline from the movie. Found out that when I used to use when I used was in a class where the slides were on the movie one, they turned the compression turned them in the garbage. Oh, okay. Now some of these slides, not th these ones, aren't on my website, but there's ones which are similar. The alt ones, for instance, are on my website. So in PDF form, they're on my website, and yeah, do and that. some from Berkeley, which are not quite exactly what I did here, but let's say 85 percent. I gave it about two weeks ago. They're on my website. Yeah. Uh, before, okay, let's thank our speaker first. I guess I, I want to give a chance to NCAT if they have any questions. Sure. Are there any questions? Hello. Yes. Yes. Um, did you did you look at the singular perturbation problem for the tenth order polynomial? What do you mean? Uh, well, like in the books by Nafe, for example, he uses uh, singular perturbation problem and distinguished limits. It's a bit fuzzy about the, te the terminology, but uh, uh, well, you resolve these singularities, you know. The, remember the z 10 to the minus 10, z 10 to the 10 minus z 10 to the 9 plus. He has a very interesting way of solving it. Yeah, well, the thing is this. we it, it Typically what happens with the, I'm sorry, the cameras are, <laughs> sorry, I don't know, which way do you see me? I, I want to look at you, but the, <laughs> they used to have a screen in the back where you could see you, but it doesn't work. Right. So, <laughs> yeah. all right, so I'm looking this way. All right, so, all right. Um, Typically, what happens is the when they, these things arise, this, we you know the polynomial systems arise, and they usually have many variables. So, if you had just one variable, you can do certain tricks. But when they have a lot of variables, uh, you know you can always there's always things you can do. But we don't want to use cleverness. We want things where people throw their systems in, and, and then you you get an answer which you, you know is accurate. So. We have. I am not. See, I'm not. I'm 100% sure of the thing you're talking about. I have not seen that. We do certainly use different parameter spaces. We do use. Uh, so I. But I'm. I'm not exactly answering your thing because I'm not 100% sure what you know. I don't. Well, I, I think what he's talking about. No problem. <laughs> I think what he's talking about is basically uh, he's saying to resolve. Uh, you know, to resolve your uh, critical points of that of that uh, equation, you can always use a perturbation method. Which I oh. think, in, in a sense, in yeah. a sense, is what you're doing through your homotopy. Yeah. So okay. So I understand. So you, you mean, for instance, if you had this multiple zero, you, you perturb the equation a little, and the multiple zero disappears. It becomes that's like ten isolated points. Yes, and uh, he has, I think, distinguished uh, limits. Uh, well, some of the ratios will make sense, some don't, and you can pick up the, the solutions near very singular points. Okay. Uh, I can't explain it like that. I mean, you have to see the algebra is quite involved. Yeah. So we don't, uh, we, we take advantage of using the multi-precision and using this, you know, the Cauchy integral. And so we can, we can take care of essentially, you know, if you're willing to pay the price of the number of digits and you know your, you know, you know your equations accurately enough, you can, you can carry out the computations. And what Dr. Krim was saying was right. We, when we come in with that homotopy, we're coming in from non-singular things. So right when t is small, they have these points are separate points that are coming in. So we actually do have a resolution of the singularity into a cluster. 
Um, a third thing I'll throw out, and this is something which, you know, for us was one of the reasons why these methods apply so well to engineering problems, is that in engineering problems where there's usually working on a parameter space, when it looks like something is a multiple zero, it usually is a multiple zero. I mean, so getting clusters of points turns out to be not so common. When they're clusters, typically they really are a single zero. And that's something we've, and it's not a proof, it's not a theorem, it's, not, it's just a, a fact, a nice fact of life in the, the engineering world. But I will look up what you mentioned and see you. Any other questions? Any other questions? So I keep looking and I, I'm not used <laughs> to this. <so. laughs> Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you. I, I, I may send you the uh, reference. Oh, please do. Thank you very much. Then also I have your name. That helps. I like that. Okay. Any any questions here? Hmm. All right. Okay. If there are no more questions, let's start our speaker. This is my first distance learning class I've ever had. You know, actually I teach out of this.